Bestie fam, the time is now. Festival goers unite. Welcome to the Bestie Files, where we interview and spotlight interesting personalities, inspiring personalities that help bring the festival experience to life because everybody contributes to the festival experience. Whether you're an attendee, whether you are an artist, whether you're backstage getting event production ready. So my name is Desmond Beristain, CEO and founder of Festi. And today we get to bring on special guest, director of operations at Envision Festival. He's worked with events such as Symbiosis, which is an epic festival, um, Enchanted Forest, and the list goes on and on. He's the CEO of Mindful Massive, and uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce Ryan Candle. It's actually Candell. I knew he was going to tell me that too. I, oh. that part, I didn't realize. I was like, all right, let's see. There's there's two L's. I was like, dude, it's either Candle, but it probably isn't. And then he got me. So there it is. But uh, welcome to the Festy Files. Um, I'm all decked out here. We just got done doing a Festy Fitness, so I do like fitness coaching. So we just filmed. So I just came straight from there. But we're we're glad that you were able to tune in and. Um, Let's talk festivals, let's talk the industry, let's talk tech, uh, let's talk your story. So we'll start there, just give us your, your intro and what has brought you uh, to the music festival industry and um, express your kind of passion for it. Cool, man, yeah. Um, you know, as you said, I'm uh, currently the director of operations for Envision Festival, um, but I also own a company with my wife called Mindful Massive, uh, which we started in 2013. Um, and really the, the story started, um, as me making music and, and starting DJing, um, in around 2010, um, I've always been a musician and grew up playing uh, guitar and saxophone and all that kind of stuff. And at some point I got a wild hair at my house and decided that I wanted to start making music. Uh, and at that point we were living in Lake Tahoe, California, um, and we freshly moved there and a good friend of mine, uh, by the name of Tynan got into DJing together uh, without really knowing much about the electronic scene or really anything. And at that point we were playing hip hop and reggae uh, cause that was kind of like what we both loved and where our roots were. Um, and slowly but surely uh, we decided that we wanted to start playing shows out, you know, from, from like the bedroom DJ to the club, the club vibe. And there was not really a scene happening here very much. There was one uh, promoter in the area at the time, um, a gentleman by the name of Steve, Steve Emmerich, who is a super close friend now and runs a company called Fresh Bacon. And they were doing back then this festival called The Bounce, which was really, really awesome. And kind of a, um, they were kind of some of the first to really get on the electronic music transformational festival game. Uh, this was in like 2007 through 2012-ish. Um, so we started throwing parties in South Lake Tahoe, real small reggae hip hop parties just for us basically. So we could play music in front of people. And that turned into people wanting to do more and the scene started to build and then Mindful Massive was born and, and Mindful Massive really started uh, with a motto and, and with a vibe and the vibe was that we're stronger together than we are apart. And that's still 100% true today and really our goal with starting Mindful Massive was to pay our friends to do what they love. That was like the two things we started with. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know where we were going or how we were going to do it. We were just like, we want to do what we love and we want to be able to pay people to do what they love. Mm -hmm. um, so we started throwing parties in, in South Lake Tahoe and then that turned into a weekly party at this place called Whiskey Dicks on Tuesdays. And that was Massive Tuesday, which we ran for four years straight every Tuesday. And there we really kind of broke a lot of the, the artists that are popular now in, in, in the electronic culture. And um, we just got lucky, I guess, and we were kind of like ahead of the curve a little bit. And we were booking all kinds of, of acts that are, you know, essentially bigger, bigger acts now, like G. Jones and uh, Callius and Toa and um, Glad Kill and Sugar Pill and all these like kind of like first wave artists. Um, we were, we were putting in this little 200 person venue on a Tuesday night in a small town and it was just going off. So at some point we decided that it was a good idea to throw a music festival and none of us had ever really done that before. We'd only been to the bounce and been to reggae on the river. Um, 
So, you know, like four or five of us, uh, close friends that were producing this weekly just kind of jumped in head first and decided we were going to plant the seed as we called it the seed party, which was our first event, which was, we called base mountain. And, uh, we basically threw a free party <clears throat> up in the mountains, um, that we called seed party. And we only told the DJs directions, you know, real renegade style, uh, not private property, no tickets, none of that kind of stuff. We just found the sweet spot of the mountains and we leaked directions to it and we brought a big sound system and generators and lighting and uh, popped off an all night party. And that just kind of like concreted, I think, without really knowing it at the time, my feet into this industry. So fast forward, you know, we, we produced that party and then uh, a lot of people showed up, the cops came, we somehow talked our way through it and they let us keep partying because we were on public land that was allowed to be loud. You were allowed to be loud. It was an off road vehicle park. And uh, in turn, we got a lot of good feedback and our, our social media grew and our parties, our weekly parties got better and everyone wanted more festival. So the next, the following year, this was 2011, 2011, we through a party at a venue, um, we, we found this uh, a good friend of ours who was part of the Moon Tribe crew, um, connected us to a property and was like just kind of this wild, you know, farm, farm property that uh, this guy wanted, was cool with us throwing a party at. And we did and uh, like, you know, six, 700,000 people, something like that showed up and we booked a bunch of big acts and it went well. and. We did it again the next year at a bigger, better property and more people showed up and uh, we had a bunch of headliners and, you know, it, it started to become a thing. And then 2013, going into 2013, um, we were, you know, kind of getting ready for our biggest year yet. And we had OPO booked and all these seemingly big acts for us at the time. Uh, and our permit got pulled a week before the event. And you know, this was as grassroots as it gets. Like my wife and I were basically the only funders of the whole event. We had all of our personal money dumped into it and we, we kind of went up against the government and there was nothing we could do. We had to, we had to cancel the event one week before. Um, and it was definitely like a turning point unknowingly for, for me in my career, because at that point I'd really only worked for myself and worked with our friends to produce events. And at that point we kind of got the, carpet yanked out from underneath us and uh took like a moment of reflection and lost a bunch of money and you know kind of felt defeated and very sh shortly after uh other events started to reach out to me and say that they wanted you know they heard that we threw good parties and they heard that we produced beautiful events and that they wanted our help to produce their events and you know here i was thinking that this like door slams slam closed and we were done with throwing everything and it was like actually a bigger door blasted wide open and you know a chant that was when uh, a chanted forest reached out to me uh and said that they needed help and now now the guy that threw enchanted forest tolku is, is a close friend of mine but back then we didn't really even know each other he just kind of called me on a whim and same thing with lucidity festival down in santa barbara yeah, uh, yeah. just through travels and meeting people and uh, Elliot, the production manager at the time, reached out to me and was like, hey, we need, you know, we need help supporting our operations and doing power and water and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, let's, let's see what happens. Let's do it. Wow. So just went down the rabbit hole of, you know, just helping other people produce their events, which I actually found a lot of enjoyment in uh, pretty quickly. Uh, something about not using your own bank account to fund your, your fund. That's <laughs> And you, and you already were using your own bank account to fund. So like you Correct, went yeah. through that gauntlet already, you know, sure. so to be on the other side, you're like, Hey, I was already doing it at this level. So it probably breathed in even more confidence and enthusiasm just to be like, shoot. You know, we call it college, like the producing our own events and producing the festival without like a lot of help and mentorship was, was basically like going through school of hard knocks, you know, it is like going to college without, really having any books or <laughs> any, any school plan. You just kind of like, okay, we got to figure it out. Okay. We need a box office. So we're going to need volunteers. So we got to figure, figure out how to build volunteer ships. And then we got to figure out how to get the volunteers. You know, it was like everything about it was that way. But I think it made 
uh, myself and Rondi, my partner, are better leaders now and, and better in understanding like all the pieces that go into the puzzles to produce these other events, which we now work for. For sure. It definitely yeah. set, set us up to be able to understand the bigger picture of, you know, how these, these big events operate. Yeah, that's exactly what, you know, when people attend events, so much goes into it. And I mean, it's probably challenging to even think about everything that goes into it, but to start by throwing your own smaller events and watch it grow. Um, talk about that. Talk about really what goes into an event and how, you know, you can put so much into it and then figure, find out, oh, your permit didn't, you know, get passed. And then it's like, shoot. You know, so I think people, so that everyone could understand when festivals do come back, wow, what really goes into them to, to make this happen um, so that they can, you know, admire not just the, the, main, the main acts, but everything that goes into it because everything plays a role. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the scale, you know, is exponential. And, and for us, you know, when we started and we were producing Base Mountain, it was, you know, a thousand person event. And there was literally like five people that did all of the planning for a thousand people. You know, it was, it was like a core group of us and, you know, we had an art gallery manager, we had a main stage manager, we had a volunteer manager, and then we had five of us doing everything. And, uh, the scale, you know, then the scale seemed huge, but now looking back on, on what we're doing and like, you know, for instance, Envision Festival, um, which is my biggest, my biggest project slash accomplishment, I, I would say, um, and the thing I'm most proud of because it's it's huge it's crazy it's in a wild country everything's hard there um, and i think we produce a really beautiful boutique and result that's different than anything in the world but to give you an idea like I, I run the operations for envision just the operations department is 300 employees wow you know so just just to do that is 300 people and and you know we're talking about a 10,000 person event but the scale that goes into it is is insane and you know same thing for symbiosis same thing for for edc for electric forests like you know the bigger the bigger it gets just the more details and the more uh the more people really it takes to understand every little logistic and keep those gears rolling so smooth for all the people uh, we had we had the pleasure of, of building uh, a stage for electric forest last year their new uh the honeycomb stage which was their new new stage, new environment. And uh, I, it definitely humbled our whole crew, you know, and it was basically our, our Envision crew was there. My, my wife is a designer and a fabricator. and She designed and, and put that whole stage together and we all worked with her to build. And wow, so humbling. I mean, 50,000 people at, at Electric yeah. Forest, the amount of gears that are turning there in comparison to what we're used to in Envision was like, wow, this is awesome, you know? Yeah. It's, it's cool. It takes a lot. It takes a, it takes an army to produce a smooth event. And I think anyone that's ever been to an event that wasn't smooth recognizes that right away. But usually when people are at events that run super smooth and they're just having a good time with all their friends and everything, like they don't even notice. They're just like, oh, that was great. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, man. So you um, work for a full year to produce Envision Festival and have it be smooth. And does this start like, does it start right after, like as soon as the festival's done, you guys wrap it up for like what, a month and then you just start prepping for the next following year, the next season? Yeah. Legitimately, I mean, I've been on, uh, I do weekly calls with Envision. That's actually what I have after you is my, is my weekly Envision call. And um, yeah, we're, we're talking about right now, we obviously have a lot of topics because our world is so changed, you know, yeah. and it impacts festival culture so much that I think every, event that cares about living through COVID is, is, uh, is talking about ways to get creative right now. For sure. For sure. Um, let's talk about Envision because I'm going to share a story. Uh, when we first started making Festi uh, and making our prototypes, we started traveling. We went to Japan and tested it there. And then we went to Costa Rica. And I vividly remember like getting off the airplane or on the airplane. I see so many people and I could just feel the festival vibe. So I'm like, what's going on here? I'm just going to Costa Rica to check out the scenery and the jungle and try to test in the jungle. But there are literally hundreds of festival goers um, on this flight. And we get to the airport, you see this, like an artist come through. I'm like, all right, so what's happening? And then I start reaching out to my contacts and they're like, dude, you don't know? Envision's happening. And I was like, Envision? 
And then that's when I saw the, the trailer and I'm like, you guys are able to infuse, um, you know, the festival culture from, from the arts to uh, yoga. And, and there were, that, yeah, yogis coming out. And I'm like, dude, they're, they're, they're adding everything in one from music to to health and wellness, to um, destination festivals, which is probably, you know, the future of festivals. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it, it sounds amazing. Um, we talk about it all the time. Like that's literally on our bucket list, like Envision. And um, maybe talk about Envision Festival, what separates it from other festivals in your opinion, and why so many people gravitate towards this festival. I mean, literally coming from all over, all over the world. I, I was at the airport talking to people. Like, I'm here for Envision. I'm here. And I'm like, See, that's, that's the magic right there that you guys were able to uh, kind of encompass in this event. Yep. Yeah, I think um, what, what makes Envision unique for me, I've been working for Envision for five years, and I knew about it for probably five years before that. You know, I've been hearing uh, about people telling me how unique it was and how different it was, and, and what really captured my heart uh, going there the first time um, was a lot of what you just said was just, the, the festival is really built on sustainability, on healthy lifestyle, on education, on yoga, and, and music um, obviously is a key element of, of every festival, but that's kind of one thing that every festival does. You know, like we can't compete with Electric Forest when it comes to music or EDC or even Symbiosis, who is, you know, 10 times bigger than we are. Um, but what we do very, very well is we curate an experience that ideally leaves you. Um, kind of feeling like a new person when you leave, you know, and, and leaving with those, uh, those new values, those, those sustainability models, those healthy, those healthy eating models, those permaculture models, maybe yoga, maybe learning, you know, like, uh, our, our content is really built around all of those aspects. It's not just like music 24 hours a day and some yoga on the side. We're like, yoga 24 hours a day, healthy eating 24 hours a day, permaculture 24 hours a day, music 24 hours a day, like you choose your adventure. Um, and, and even more than that, the whole festival is built on sustainable materials in every way. Wow. wow. We use no, tr we, well, I can't say we use no trussing. We use a little bit of trussing on one of our stages to hang lights with, but really otherwise, everything is built out of bamboo or of local materials sourced right there in Uvita. We buy all of our hardware, all of our lumber, everything comes from local farms and, and local bamboo farms. And we really pride ourselves on building things architecturally beautiful and sustainably beautiful. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And uh, I'm sure everybody, everybody attending the festival is conscious of the trail they, they're leaving behind, right? So making sure to clean out for themselves, um, throw away their trash. And that's something that right now with, with everything going on uh, as a community, we should all kind of, we're at home, we're able to have that additional reflective time. You know, once these festivals, because they will come back, we will be back at festivals, it might take a little time, but once that happens, everyone, um, let's all elevate ourselves and, and be conscious of you know, the trail we leave behind. You know, when you're at a festival, throw away your trash. If you're going through a, a crowd and you accidentally bump into someone, you know, say excuse me or say, you know, sorry. Like these are the little things that us collectively uh, can, can raise uh, together, you know what I mean? So that we, when we go back, we are appreciative and we understand what we're stepping back into and um, we're doing it at, a, at an elevated, uh, elevated vibration. So um, For sure. because, yeah, we're at home. Yeah, you wanna add on to that? Uh, well, one thing you brought up um, that, you know, I'd love to touch on is, is like you said, the trash. And uh, I know I've, I've worked a lot of big and small events and I've seen kind of like all extremes of the, the after impact of people partying on, on land, you know, and, and how trashed festival sites can be and um, operations and eco and sustainability crews are always the last ones on site. No matter what, we are always the ones that pick up every last cup and make sure that the site is as pristine or better, you know, as we like to say, leave it better than the way you found it. Um, that's, that's our crew specifically in at Envision. We have a huge eco initiative, uh, for teaching people about how to deal with their trash. And we actually won a greener festival award last year, um, for being one of the greenest festivals in the world. And, and a lot of that was based on how we deal with all of the different things that are like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, products of us producing the festival, for instance, trash, and smog, and diesel gas, and gray water, and black water, and all this stuff. 
we've, we've written comprehensive plans and we've actually worked with the greener festival people to kind of like analyze and audit every little system we've built over the years as to why things work the way they work and how we can do them better. So our trash team, like we don't have trash cans spread out through the whole festival site. We only have a few near stages and then we have this beautiful eco um, center, which is kind of on the way out of our gate. So you have to walk by it and staff is in, or guests are encouraged to sort their own trash, learn about how our sustainability models work and then bring their trash to the eco station to actually learn like what happens. There we have plastic melting machine and you can, you can melt down all your bottles and make like Envision brand necklaces. Like there's a variety of different incentives to learn about about your trash and like why you know you feel that way about it and how you what you can do personally not only in costa rica but at home to change your impact exactly that's that's what you just mentioned it 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 extends beyond the festival experience you know what i mean so one thing that you might go to envision thinking i'm just gonna you know um i'm gonna immerse myself in, in, in whatever's going on and that's having a great open mind and then you might come home and and have those tips and things that you learned at the festival that now you're going to implement to your daily life because it extends beyond the festival and um i think that's something cool about destination festivals you're traveling into another land and you just have to fully kind of immerse yourself to get the most out of it um, mm -hmm. Speak about destination festivals because I feel like up until now there, there was a huge surge and it seemed like that's kind of where the future of festivals were, was going where it's like take yourself and literally go into another land and just kind of uh, embrace it all. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, the, the destination thing is really impactful on a human level because it takes you out of your comfort zone. And a lot of the time when you remove yourself from your comfort zone, it's a lot easier to break barriers that you have already set for yourself. Uh, just, you know, naturally, uh, I've personally felt that way about Burning Man the first time I went there because it feels like you're kind of on a, you know, a remote planet. And as soon as you kind of like remove all the stuff you're used to, it's a lot easier to see a new perspective. And, uh, Envision is the same way, you know, you're, no one's used to living, unless you live in Costa Rica or live in the jungle, you're not used to like having monkeys swing over your head and eating pineapples right off of the plant. And like that, it's just, it, it feels different. And in turn it makes you kind of analyze your own behavior, I think, a little bit. For sure. Yeah, you mentioned the wildlife. Costa Rica, just everyone, if you're, if you're traveling, you know, once that time comes, it, that was one thing that I definitely saw in Costa Rica. You'll be eating your lunch, you look to your left, and you see a beautiful scenery, and then you see literally monkeys doing their thing, chilling. You look up in the sky, you might see a couple macaw parrots flying through, um, even, even like a toucan or, or whatnot, and iguanas. They're everywhere, so it's, it's great to, I feel like that's the thing about Envision, you really immerse yourself with not just the, the, the human, uh, you know, experience, but like just life in general. You know, For sure, and we are 100% in the real jungle. There's yeah. actual group of monkeys that live on the site that wake us up every single morning through the whole build. You know, like the monkeys literally live like over our houses and like jump up on the roofs and like bang on the roofs in the morning. And it's just like a whole different world. It's, it's really <laughs> amazing. I feel blessed to be able to live in Costa Rica for three, four months a year for the last five years. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Recommend it for anyone. Yeah. If you can make it to the festival, great. If you're just going out there to, to just catch a vibe, that's also amazing. Um, let's talk about like, so right now we mentioned it, people have to, People are really getting creative, you know, all the creators, all the artists, we're finding ways. And it's, I personally, you know, think it's commendable, the response, the immediate response, the, the electronic, uh, you know, music industry had to, to this by throwing on the live streams and raising, you know, having ways you can donate and get involved. Um, talk about some of the creative things you've seen and maybe even the, some of the creative ways, uh, whatever you can talk about that you guys are looking to, to get out there, possibly give back to the community, even if it's just shedding some positivity during these times. Totally, yeah, well, like you said, the live stream thing, I mean, I know personally, I've been uh, watching Twitch pretty much daily. Uh, it's, I think it's awesome getting to see artists that you like or you appreciate like live and direct from you know, their houses. And uh, it's almost more heartfelt in a way. Uh, to actually kind of get the music that way. It's not like this prompted, we paid you 50 grand to play for us one hour set thing. You know, it's like, you're doing this because you feel the need for music in the world right now. You're not doing this because 
you have a dance floor of 10,000 people or you have a big paycheck, like, and you can feel that, you know, you can feel it in, in the streams, in my opinion. And, uh, I think it's really awesome watching it all happen. Uh, some, some of the notable ones, you know, like the couch fam thing was pretty big. Um, I don't know if you watched that one, but uh, I was in and out of that lucidity festival. One was really cool. Uh, those are our, fr our close friends and a uh, festival that's close to the heart. Um, and they did kind of try to diversify and did yoga and workshops and sustainability as well as music. Um, and they actually used a stage that we built as their backdrop, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't, there's, God, it's been so diluted. Uh, also for me, I, I've personally been watching the roots quest love, uh, yes. yep. daily. Yep. We but, even put him on our lineup. We have a, we have a lineup of all the live streams and I was like, dude, you know, obviously we started with the core of EDM, but I'm like, Questlove has been doing it. And he did like, what, two already. So we're like, nope, you got to add that on. You got to add that on. We want to incorporate all these live streams because you said it's, it's just a little more personal. Um, and it just gives you a little more intimate touch with the artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, I love uh, electronic music. And uh, it's definitely close to my heart. But when I'm at home, I would say I listen to reggae, funk, Motown, bluegrass, hip hop, probably more than I listen to electronic music. Um, so it's been really nice for me to get, you know, get some of those flavors in and, uh, and quest love is like a walking, you know, dictionary when it comes to music culture, like he did five days of prints in a row and talked about like every, the reason behind every song and what he was doing in his life when that happened and like how that impacted the culture at the time. And, that, that's the stuff that, that gets me uh, personally right now. But, you know, as far as the future of, of streaming and online and, and all of that, it seems to me like it's only going to get bigger. The audiences are growing. Everyone seems to be like looking to the online platforms to keep their brands alive, you know, and you can see that with Insomniac. You can see that the Lost Land streams, like everyone's doing it, you know, so what makes it unique? I think content is one thing. I think the brand is another thing, you know, how much, how much you, you know, personally have a connection to that brand mm -hmm. and why you watch it in the first place. You know, I think it, Insomniac has been doing really cool stuff and that they built out like a stage in a warehouse somewhere. I don't know if, yeah. you, if you've seen Insomniac uh, yep. live stream, but it, I think that's cool. We've actually been talking about doing that uh, mindful massive because we have a warehouse and a bunch of stages and cool tech stuff that, it's just kind of hanging out right now. So we've actually been throwing those ideas around as well of maybe building a festival stage in a warehouse and doing live streams with an actual legit DJ booth and not just like superimposed green screen stuff. Um, yeah, I think, I think people are going to get creative. I think there's a lot of people working on live platforms where they can charge um, for their content. You know, I think it's cool that everyone's doing free stuff right now, but I bet you that we will see, uh, pay to play services start to happen, which I think is totally fair. Personally, you know, I'd be happy to pay five bucks or 10 bucks to watch my favorite artists in a content in a curated lineup of good yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. Gonna, um, we kind of, so yeah, that's the whole thing. Like with these, uh, events doing the donation on the weekend, like, you know, I'm like, yeah, you would spend, easily probably 50 bucks going to see an artist and then like getting one drink. If, if that's what you do, um, that's already like 50 bucks. So I'm like, I can easily donate $10 during a set because you're, you're killing it right now. You know what I mean? And, um, it is super understandable that artists and creators still need to bring in some income in one way, shape or form. Right. So whether you're a vendor and you're looking for a place to sell online or whether you're an artist, um, Let's talk about how you mentioned uh, G Jones. You know, I got to go back there because we love to share like kind of just stories. And you said you guys booked G Jones and he's, to well, me, he, I, was, he was Grizzly J at the time when we booked him actually. And that was <laughs> in 2012 or something. I, you know, that was a long time ago. <laughs> That's amazing. He was Grizzly J? Yeah. That, well, back then, you know, that was, that was Grizzly J. Uh, G Jones. That was before he changed his name to G Jones. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't really have too many stories, I guess, about that particular booking, but um, you know, the wormhole guys and the Oakland slash Bay area scene uh, have always been close friends. And 
I feel like we all kind of, we all kind of like we're pouring gas in the fire at the same time, you know, and that's really what, uh, what sparked the, like, at least the Northern California, like kind of West coast push of, of festival vibes is there was like a lot of crews in a lot of different cities, you know, in Santa Cruz and Bay area and Tahoe in in Reno in Sacramento, like just the whole Northern California and Humboldt were all kind of, like I said, pouring gas on the same fire. And all of a sudden there was like all these cool events that all kind of felt like all of our DJ friends and all of our, our culture, so to speak, that we'd been, you know, that we'd been building. Um, and, and G Jones uh, was definitely a part of that. You know, he was like an early Bay area <clears throat> um, DJ that was Grizzly J, Grizzly J back then and was okay. playing like, you know, like parties at, hot springs and shit that we were doing and it was it was those were good times you know that like we were all young and we were just just playing house parties and djing and just trying to have fun and a lot of those people a lot of those people we met back then uh are still friends now and it's it's awesome to see most you know blown up like a lot of, yeah. a lot of big acts have yeah. come from small parties you, yeah you get to see them blow up in front of you they're they're close they're like homies and um you mentioned it like the bay area northern cal over the last probably what 15 12 years just like went from very few events to like now you got like halcyon sf you have you know snow globe tahoe has been throwing down and and it's just like to see that come to life over the last decade or so uh, it must feel and then like you said you have that personal connection with some of these artists it just must feel really gratifying to just be happy for the whole scene in general from that location, right? It's awesome, man. And I, I mean, I, I feel the goosebumps every time I'm like somewhere totally random and I run into somebody that I've known for a long time. And I, and I think about like, well, how did we even meet? How, <laughs> why are we friends? You know, and like, why are we bumping into each other in Costa Rica or in, you know, the, the East coast or in Mexico or wherever we are, like all, you know, globally, I feel like I run into people that I've known for a long time and it's totally through this culture and meeting all these people like sleeping on my couch, you know, 10 years ago to play a DJ set in a 200 person shitty nightclub or, or, or whatever, you know, like it, it's just, it's grown so much. And, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's, it feels good. That's it's awesome, cool. man. It's, it's, it's you know, it's fueled by passion. I think, uh, Obviously, when you start, when you guys started throwing events, you were, you know, maybe you were thinking like it's gonna go big. Maybe you were just like, let's start here, let's see what happens. Um, maybe you can let's share some tips on. Right, I'm at home right now. <laughs> I have festival fever. And I want to get out there, but now even more than that, I'm like, you know what? I want to start my own festival. I want to get it going. I want to be able to at least to try and see if I could become the next, you know, X Y Z festival. What are some tips that you would give to somebody that has that type of uh, ambition or aspirations? Um, well, you know, I think the culture and, and the like community is probably the first and foremost, like you, you don't get, um, you don't get people buying tickets unless you have people supporting your culture and your brand and your community, you know, and for us, uh, at least what helped us become successful was that we cared way more about the community than we cared about making money ever. We were just like, we want to get all these people together, you know, like everyone loves the same thing. How can we get all these people in one room or get them all under the stars or, you know, whatever it was like, it just, it wasn't never about making money. It was always about community. And I think the same is, is, uh, is present now more than ever, you know, it's like having that fan base, having, having the people that actually want to, be a part of what you're creating or what that vision is first and foremost. And then the second piece of advice I would say would be hire professionals. <laughs> you know, that's, that's one thing uh, we never did. We just kind of became the professionals, but it was definitely the hard way to the end. And, you know, if we would have, <laughs> we would have just hired people that were, were better at it than we were at the time and had more experience, I'm sure it would have been an easier road and it might've cost us a little more money on the way, but it would have made life so much easier. Guarantee you. <laughs> for sure yeah, man it's, it's but you guys were being resourceful with what with what you have and i feel like in the beginning that's kind of what you have to do um even with us we were festival goers creating a technology project uh technology product and just jumping right into that scene and then learning really quickly after we did the whole million views and people were like well will it be ready for edc 2018 mm -hmm. will it be ready for this i'm like okay hold on 
proving the concept is one thing. Actually bringing it to life for scale to make sure on all levels it's running, uh, it's a whole another journey. And as you mentioned, like you learn a ton. Um, we did have to bring in some more experienced people in that field, uh, but also just like, and you do make mistakes, you know, but you, it, it just makes you stronger for it. If you can now, I'm sure everyone, the second time going around, and that's why when you started working with other festivals, you had already made so many mistakes that you already knew kind of, all right, this is how we're going to avoid this and avoid this. And I'm sure that probably added value to the whole mindful, massive, um, just vision and uh, value proposition. For sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, that snowball effect that you were talking about is real. And that's, that's something I didn't, I maybe I didn't expect or didn't really even consider when we started throwing parties and, and throwing the festival and getting involved with all this stuff, how fast the support would happen, how, how quickly we would be like going from um, building, you know, a DJ booth, DJ booth in our living room to building like a stage for electric forest. It just, it felt so like, Whoa, this thing is happening fast. And we got a lot of momentum and here we go. You know, like it, it's just part of, uh, I guess part of that support that you would, you know, you get from your community and part of, um, part of that snowball effect and it feels good. And I would definitely urge anyone that is interested in, in going after a passion, whether it's starting a festival or anything to go after that feeling and to chase it and, and, embrace it because it's it's crazy but it uh it works it for sure works and the more energy you have behind you the easier it is to accomplish big goals and the same thing with people you know and like from our uh from our original motto that we're stronger together than we are apart it's 100 percent got us where we are you know if we weren't supportive of our community and our uh assets and our friends and these people that have been with us since the beginning we definitely wouldn't be where we are right now for sure, for sure. I think that's like words of wisdom right there. Um, talk about Mindful Massive. A couple more things. Talk about Mindful Massive What's and what's next for you guys. I'm sure you guys are, like I said, coming up with creative ways to just get involved and give back. But um, yeah, what's, what's next in the overall vision of what you guys are encompassing moving forward? Uh, I'm sure as, as scary as it may be, at a scary time, it's also exciting because now we're really forced to tap into that whole innovation um, within us. And it's kind of like when you first started, right? You guys had to figure some stuff out. And uh, here we are again, but doing that for the next stage and then the next stage after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're, um, you know, we're trying to deeply analyze uh, what it is that we, for one, love to do for events and how we can cross that market over to, uh, you know, domestic and home life. And um, we've been talking a lot about building art uh, for people's homes. We've been talking a lot about using our technology and the stuff we've been working on to help people in their everyday lives. Um, but, you know, we obviously we'd love to get back into event culture when it's, when it's ripping again, you know, we don't want to put that down and we've, we've worked hard to get to the point where we are and we're excited about creating more big art and big stages and running more, uh, big events really. Um, but, the world kind of sets that pace right now. So we're basically just trying to be as creative as possible and use our brains and stimulate and learn and get better at our craft in this time when we're all kind of hanging out at home. What better time to, to force yourself to be better at what you're doing? For sure. There it is. Um, and yeah, kind of that's words from the CEO of Mindful Massive right there. How about some, uh, just kind of a final reflection to the community. Um, something that you could just share with them to uplift. I mean, this whole podcast has been uplifting. Thank you for joining us. Now, just if you could just give them one kind of in a sentence or two, what we got to do because the festival community is coming back and coming back stronger. And even though we're not physically at festivals, the festival experience of uh, the festival spirit should definitely still be, you know, uh, pervasive and going through all of us and flowing through all of us during these times because hey it's festival season it just looks a little different right now and we're going to be better for it we're all going to grow closer through it so uh pass it to you for sure yeah um i mean i i would say you know keep it creative for one keep stimulating your brains don't rely on this this culture to stimulate you because that stimulation is internal you know and and you can get that same feeling um, whether you're creating art at home or writing music or talking to your partner or reading a book or learning a new skill. Uh, other thing I would say is 
is use our voices, you know, like this culture uh, is built on expression, on free thinking, on sharing our opinions. What a better time for us to be thinking about voting, thinking about the state of our world, thinking about what we can do with our own opinions and our own voices to actually change the entire world to be better and, and more in line with things that we love about festival culture. Um, for me, that's, that's the biggest message right now. It's like, I, I personally am not really in line with the decisions of our current government and the world that's happening around us. And if I could use my voice to get people to use their brains more and to, to actively speak up and to vote and to use their opinions to, to create that world around us and not just like plan on festies being the place where they get to meet all the cool free thinking people and the people that have the like-minded views, but let's make this world, that world, you know, like that's, that's the message. And I, and I think that's the message that got me from festivals when I was a, a, a participant before I even started working. It was like, look at all this, this group think, you know, how can we, how can we spread this mentality? And that doesn't mean partying and, you know, doing substances and all that stuff. That's like, how can we share our thoughts and, and really get to the next level of, of consciousness and keep the evolution moving? For sure. For sure. That's, you just mentioned it. Like there tends to be this, you know, from, from the outside looking in, uh, someone that hasn't attended festivals, they look at the culture and they, they think that they may think that, you know, partying and substances and reckless or whatnot, but there's so much more that goes into it. I think, you know, one of the missions of this podcast is to spotlight, Hey, no, there are some, there are amazing people that collectively come together and make this happen. And, you know, they're humans and they have inspiring stories to tell. Um, you just mentioned it like, yeah, we're providing, you know, we're trying to be a light right now, but everyone has that light within them. And right now it's time to, you know, look into that light, reflect so that we can all just be able to, to raise our consciousness collectively. Exactly. Don't just talk shit, make the change, grow your food, you know, change, change that mentality, spread that outlook. That's, that's what we need. That's, and especially from, from people that are, you know, younger people that are sub 50, uh, are the, that's, that's the market that needs to vote. That's the market that's going to change the world right now. And, that, and coincidentally, that's a lot of the market that goes to festivals. You know, it's like, these are the people that, that will shape our world over the next 20, 30 years. Like we have control over where we're going. So the more, I think the more that the youth understands that and, and like really grasps that the, the better world we'll live in in the future. 100%. Uh, we just, I was doing this uh, Festi Fitness where we're just like trying to provide people with workouts they could do at home without any equipment. Um, but I would throw in quotes during like the minute of rest. And one of the quotes that I threw out was, be the energy you wish to receive. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Simply put, like you want positive vibes, put out positive vibes. You want to think deeply, start thinking deeply. And you're going to start attracting uh, very, you know, like attract like. And you want to elevate, then start trying to figure out, okay, well, what does elevation mean? Does that mean making better decisions with your food? Does that mean just how can I grow my, my consciousness and asking those questions and, and putting that energy out there because it will come back out to you? Um, for, for sure. Yeah. I mean, definitely, you know, without uh, being hippy dippy about the thing, like, it, you know, you, you are the company you keep, you are the energy that you're around, you are the energy that you put out. If, if you're a dickhead, people are going to think you're a dickhead. You know, if you're a sweet person to be around, people will get that and they will act the same way around you. It's, we, we make those changes and, you know, we're in control of that. And it doesn't have anything to do with being a, a festy or a, a look or a hippie or a intelligent person or a, the head of Microsoft or the head of Google or any of that. Like, you, you know, being a good person is, is very radiant and we're, uh, we're in control of that. So. I urge, I urge everyone that's listening to, to take, take control of that and move forward with that mentality. There it is. Well, thank you for sharing that. How can we stay connected with you? You know, uh, I'm sure people are, are going to be inspired by this. How can we reach out? Um, what's the best way to find you? Is it Instagram? Is it a website? Uh, how can we um, stay connected and support? Instagram, Mindful Massive. Facebook, Mindful Massive. Mindfulmassive.com. Um, you know, 
check out Instagram uh, Envision or any of the events we work. We have some art on there. On our Mindful Massive Instagram, you can see a lot of the art represented that uh, Rondi, my partner, has built over time. And then Mindful Massive is produced as a company, uh, as well as some of our previous events. We try to keep that stuff active, um, but please reach out to us. You can hit, hit us on Instagram or Mindful Massive, uh, Facebook, if you just want to say hi or shoot the shit. We're around. I think everyone's around right now. <laughs> happy to happy to share words with people or, or talk about cool stuff and yeah, just spread that spread that vibe for sure. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, Festi Files. We're gonna have to catch up and we're gonna have to get to Envision Festival whenever it happens. That is on our bucket list. Everyone, Ryan Candle with the Festi Files podcast. Everyone, take care. Peace, love, unity, and respect. Signing yeah. up.